Research is demonstrating that the most critical time for human development is the period from conception to age three. It is during that time that all bodily organs and the brain are developing most rapidly. What happens during that period profoundly impacts one's long-term health and well-being. Yet, most of the policies and programs aimed at helping children develop are really focused on children age four and above. By that time, for better or for worse, a great deal of development has already happened. Because of the importance of early childhood period on the health of our society, we'll be focusing on this developmental period on this episode of A Public Health Journal. Please stay tuned. Welcome to A Public Health Journal, a program that explores public health issues facing our society today and tomorrow. The host of the show is Dr. Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health for the State of Minnesota. A Public Health Journal is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department, all working together towards the goal of healthy people living in healthy communities. Welcome to A Public Health Journal. Today we're going to focus on the health and development of infants from the prenatal period until age three, a period that lays the groundwork for future health and well-being. Joining me in this discussion is Karen Amundsen, a public health nurse who has worked in the field of maternal and child health in Hennepin County for over 30 years. Her award-winning work has helped develop programs and policies to help all babies born in Hennepin County develop to their fullest potential. Karen, welcome to the program. Thank you. As a pediatrician who's worked in maternal and child health, it's nice to have a conversation about this prenatal period to age three, and which I you know, consider that the, really the early childhood period. Mm -hmm. Why is that so important to focus on this period in a child's development? Well, I think what we're finding more and more is that that's an essential period of time for the architecture of the brain to develop. And when we have families who are in a nurturing, caregiving relationship where the needs of the child are being um, re related to by the parents and they have a consistent uh, care that's being provided, that we see very typical and, and really very good brain development with a lot of neuron connections that sets them up for, you know, being able to develop their literacy skills and, you know, ultimately be ready for kindergarten. However, what we've found is that in many of our families, for whatever reason, that those conditions don't exist and that we have um, babies who maybe aren't being nurtured the way they should be or that they aren't able to expect that when they have a need or when they reach out to their environment that someone will respond and when that happens we see that it has an effect on the architecture of their brain. So you're talking about the fact that as kids develop you know it's a, it's a physical growing and developing and that actually the behavior or the environment around it actually affects how those connections and how the development actually occurs? Very definitely, and I think that it's been shown, certainly as we look at the research from Harvard and other um, uh, research projects and, and understand that it is something that isn't, that isn't irrevocable, but at the same time, when we have a, a change in the brain architecture that occurs that early on, it's sometimes very difficult to go back and and make things uh, normal as we as the child proceeds into you know literacy skills and preschool and into kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So I know there's things called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs mm -hmm. that people are talking about. What are those things? Well, I think those things really are related to a lot of the, the situations that we see with children whose brains may not develop typically, and, and that has to do with sort of the conditions that an, an environment that a child is born into. It, it may have to do with um, uh, the poverty, um, certainly young parents who have not had the experience of, of parenting before, um, the uh, experience of one parent or you know having multiple caregivers one or the other both are can ha be detrimental um, and, and certainly mental illness in care providers or chemical dependency a lot of the the things that that interfere with the way a parent is able to relate to their child. Mm -hmm. now, I've got a slide here that shows some demographics mm -hmm. of what's going on in Hennepin County and I think this really points out the fact that you know Hennepin County is sort of a microcosm of the state and so we have mm -hmm. you know tell us a little bit about the statistics that you're working with here in, in Hennepin County. Certainly we are seeing that 43.6 uh, percent of babies being born into poverty is a fairly high number. And when we think about that, we think about that as a proxy for, you know, some of the other um, adverse experiences that children can have that are associated with poverty. Um, 
35.8 percent are born to single mothers. When a child is born into a family with a single mother, they we frequently have other types of adversity. The mother sometimes is very young, has not had experience with parenting before, and many, many times is in poverty. Um, and the depre maternal depression. Babies being born into families where the main caregiver, which is typically the mother, is depressed, are really um, concerning to us. And I think we have become more and more aware of how important it is early on in a woman's pregnancy, and certainly at the time of birth, to take stock of how she's feeling about um, parenting her child and being able to be a care provider and, and what her mental health status is. Um, Yes, 2,300 mothers had not completed high school at the time of birth. We're working very hard and really trying to, to bring in some new and innovative ways to help teen moms who are still in school and still need to finish some type of an, an academic program, whether it's graduation or certificate or, or what we can, whatever we can do to help them um, achieve a skill and be able to get out of the high school experience with the ability to earn a living and to, at the same time, to get the skills that they need to be able to parent their child and to have some self-sufficiency. So as you're talking about the health and development of babies and you look at those statistics mm -hmm. and you talk about the things that are impacting health and development, it sounds like it's more than just a medical issue. It's more than just a public health issue. It sounds like we need a little different approach or, or not a different approach. We need everybody engaged, be it uh, public health or, or the health and the healthcare system, but the schools, mm -hmm. social service system, neighborhoods, community groups. Is that true? I think it's certainly true. Uh, um, more and more we're seeing that no one entity can really meet the needs of all of these families that have s such significant um, issues. And, and one of the things that I was thinking about when we were just talking about um, the adverse childhood experiences is homelessness and the ability to find housing for these families. Just having that sometimes will change the trajectory of how um, families are able to function. But we more and more are partnering with our um, the child welfare folks the people that are working in the um, social services and eligibility for you know various um, financial programs and and in our communities because it's not just something that the county can do it's something that we have to do together in in the various municipalities communities and and all of the different um, types of uh, areas where these families are mm -hmm. a lot of emphasis is put on third grade reading and mm -hmm. kindergarten and pre-kindergarten do you think people really understand the importance of early childhood in educational development in economic development in health development mm -hmm. You know, we hope that they do, but unfortunately, as we talk about early childhood, many times people think, frequently, it's that it begins at three. A lot of people say five. Some people say children under 10 are young children, but we know very definitely that when we see children who have not had, you know, a, a nurturing environment that we find that at 18 months we can see a big difference in the number of words that they understand receptively and also their expressive language and that feeds directly into how they're able to work in a, a preschool experience, certainly their readiness for kindergarten. And I think our biggest challenge is helping people to understand that just because they don't talk to you and can't relay some of their feelings or you can't notice some of their delays that early on, that definitely we have to be aware of, of their um, environment and their development. Right. And I know there's, there's one environmental issue and, and it's sort of a, uh, one of the leading causes of infant deaths is, is sleep, you know, mm -hmm. the improper sleep. And I want to talk about that in this, this next segment, but first we need to take a little break. We'll be back right after this message. Right, mi cariño. So like I said, everything I learned about cooking, I learned from grandmas and bananas. Shall we go again? Yep. Mix beef with the onions, the onions with the peppers, the peppers with the paprika, the paprika, the garlic, the garlic with the oregano, the oregano with the cumin. Got it? Got it. Throw on the olive, stir, season, stir again, pour out the flour, roll out the dough, make a circle, drop in a fistful of filling, fold over, press down, and ta-da! Hmm. Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day making sure they brush is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain.
Welcome back. We're talking about early childhood development with Karen Amundsen from Hennepin County's Human Services and Public Health Department. Uh, Karen, we, as we look at you know the things that it's sort of at the far end of the spectrum when children die, you know the, the leading causes of death mm -hmm. and infant mortality is one of those big issues that certainly is an, an early childhood issue. Uh, we talk about prematurity and uh, congenital anomalies. Uh, but one of the things that a lot can be done about is unsafe sleep. Tell us a little bit about why sleep is such an important uh, aspect and safe sleep is such an important mm -hmm. aspect in reducing infant deaths. Well, I think that we've just begun to realize that many of the, the infant deaths that we used to consider as just sort of unexplainable really do have a basis in the environment that the child was sleeping in. And when we go back and realize that a child may have been sleeping on their tummy and been in a situation where there were a lot of bedclothes or um, other folks in the bed and, and that the child really was in a, in a in an unsafe sleep environment and the death can be considered an accident that we now understand there are things that we can do that very definitely will decrease the risk of having an accidental death related to unsafe sleep. Okay, so we've got this video mm -hmm. that uh, brings in the medical sure. examiner who's been on this program actually talking yes. about some of those things. So, so let's roll this video about safe sleep. Not for one second did I think it was Dane. dropped him off that morning and never would have guessed that would be the end of our day. We will never be the same. And we don't have our son here. And that's all because of someone's choice. We were at the station for quite a while and we had to wait um, because Dane was still at the daycare provider's home. They were doing a thorough investigation, which we thought was just uh, routine because they left with him that morning in his car seat to bring him and here I was coming home without him. And it, I think the quietness and the emptiness, that's probably what we felt the most for months after that. You're used to joyful little life and smiles and giggles and one wrong choice, one careless decision. You know, our life will forever be changed and every day is a struggle and we will never be the same and we don't have our son here and that's all because of someone's choice and it was preventable. In a typical year in Hennepin County, the medical examiner's office will investigate approximately 15 to 20 infant deaths that have occurred in an unsafe sleep environment. When we go back and investigate those deaths, on average, we will determine that about half of them are flat out due to an unsafe sleep environment. Either the child was in a crib that was improperly put together, in a crib that had way too much excess material in it, or even more commonly, the child was sleeping on an adult bed or a couch, perhaps by themselves, but most commonly uh, with another much larger person. We did a five-year study looking at all of our infant deaths in unsafe sleep environments. The lion's share of infants who die in an unsafe sleep environment die in an adult bed. Sometimes it's because the child is left sleeping alone and they end up accidentally suffocating on the pillows or blankets or even the occasional plastic bag that's on the bed. But even more commonly, the child dies as a result of the fact that there are one or more much larger individuals in the bed with them. Sometimes it's because the adult unintentionally rolls over on the child and asphyxiates them. Sometimes it's the child is rolled onto his or her stomach and the child then asphyxiates on the blankets and pillows in the environment. We even have many cases where the children are unintentionally knocked off the bed in the middle of the night and they end up getting pinned between the bed and the adjacent wall or the end of the bed and the headboard or the child ends up on the floor face down in a plastic bag or some other environment where they can't breathe anymore. 
So again, to summarize, adult beds are definitely the biggest culprit we see in unsafe sleep environments for infants. To ensure the safest sleep environment for an infant, follow these three simple steps. First, the child should be placed in a government-approved crib. Second, they should be placed on their back. And third, they should be alone. There should be no pillows, no crib bumpers, no blankets, no toys, or any other items in the crib with the child. Well, Karen, I know early childhood is certainly a, usually a positive time, but we do have to focus on some of the negative things, and, and this is certainly one of those things, but it, in, a, in a sense is a preventable kind of a thing. So, you know, the message is safe sleep is really important, and how are you getting that message across to folks? You certainly have this video, but how, are people really recognizing the importance of safe sleep? Well, I think that we've tried uh, several things. Um, we have a training, this was the video that we have for the public, but we do have a training video for our foster parents, child care providers, folks that are you know, coming to the county for additional um, education because they are caring for children on a regular basis. Um, we also have uh, begun to really work with our child protection workers because they're in people's homes. Our staff and our, our public health staff and the folks that visit families on a regular basis are probably our best resource because they can talk to the families and see where the child is sleeping and you know really intervene at um, you know right at the time that they're they're in the home and be able to help families get access to a safe crib uh, and be able to help them understand what kinds of things they should do to keep their child yeah. safe. So, so how do you how do you link this with the move to get more people to breastfeed and a lot of people breastfeed in mm -hmm. bed and mm -hmm. see that how, how do you have that conversation with people who want to have the baby in the bed for breastfeeding and sleep mm -hmm. with the baby? Well and I think it's really important that the baby's in close proximity when you're trying to you know establish nursing especially in the first month or so but what we do recommend is that there is a separate place right next to where the mom is sleeping that the baby can be placed in to sleep and then as the baby baby awakens and the mom gets up and breastfeeds, she can stay in the bed while she's breastfeeding, but then move the baby back to the, the bassinet or the bed that's next to the next to hers so that she, the baby is not in bed with the mom. And I know there, there's a lot of cultural and mm -hmm. and age differences in terms sure. of you know what we grew up with in terms of what mm -hmm. was acceptable and what you know, the medical science is now telling us. How do you talk about that in different cultures and, and particularly with grandparents who did it one way and say you know my babies lived through all of this and it was really good? I think that's a really important question. You know, everything's about relationships, and I think particularly as we have um, home visiting and nurses in the homes, um, elders that, that are working with other members of their community, uh, folks in, you know, depending on the culture that you're talking about, there are different folks that have more um, esteem as we're, you know, passing on some of this information. So we try to, to think about what would relate best in terms of providing the information, but with respect to the culture. And that's, that's the key, is that we're not asking people to change something that's been going on for hundreds of years. Um, well, I guess we are asking, asking them to change it, but we're doing it in a way that hopefully they can still maintain some of the um, cultural importance of the way that they've done their practice. Uh, it's tough, though. Yeah. I understand. And I also want to make sure that people don't under, understand that it is, this video is not about not sending your child to no. child care, because <laughs> child care is generally a safe place, and we and want them to be safer, and that's why a lot of the Absolutely. education also goes on with child care, correct? Mm -hmm. Very, very much so, and I think um, this is a new day for child care and for early childhood in the state of Minnesota, and, and more and more we're seeing just wonderful child care um, centers and, and bringing in, you know, with all of the different ways we have now of sort of evaluating the, the quality of the child care that we use for our children, it's better than ever, so. Right, good. Well, I want to talk about some yes, of the positive sure. things that people do, and what people can do particularly, grandparents and parents mm -hmm. and neighbors, but we need to take another little break. We'll be back right after this message. They say that when you're facing extreme danger, your life flashes before you. If you think that's sad, consider facing it before you even have enough life to flash before your eyes. 
deaths, and injuries can be prevented by using the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to know what is appropriate for each age and size. Welcome back. We're talking about early childhood development with Karen Amundsen from the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department. Karen, as we talk about early childhood, one of the things about early is it fits mm -hmm. in with the public idea, health idea of identify things early, intervene early, prevent things mm -hmm. before they start to happen. It seems like early childhood we would be the perfect time to really identify issues that a child might have mm -hmm. and, and intervene if there are some risk factors. Are there screens going on for kids? Is this a time for screening for kids? Oh, definitely. I think that that's probably the one of the more important messages that anybody who's working with this population can convey to the public. And, and screening, of course, is kind of a general term, but um, most specifically, babies, uh, when they're first born, tend to go to the doctor quite a bit more they, than they do as they get to be a little bit older. But in Minnesota, we have services for I, uh, infants um, from the time they're born. If there are developmental delays that are um, found in the, and we begin to intervene with um, young infants in their homes. So uh, even though some of the infants are, are going to the doctor, once they get to be into the toddler time, they may not be going as frequently. And what we see is that sometimes people aren't noticing the way a child is developing. And so um, we really try to work with, um, you know, some of the families that are coming in just for a WIC visit or coming in for some other reason to make sure that in addition to getting the screens for their development at their regular routine medical checkups that we're also taking stock of how well are these kids developing because as I was mentioning earlier we have a very mobile population some of whom are homeless and so sometimes doctor visits get missed and sometimes some of these subtle developmental things get missed also and what we find is that when we find children young under three who do have developmental delays we can refer them to their school district and as I was saying they can get even even if they are not in a permanent home they can get an on-site intervention with their school district to help uh, that child's development improve and hopefully as we work with kids from a very young age be better ready for kindergarten when they get to age five now at three all children need to be screened for school and I think that's a message that people have sort of it's kind of an urban myth that we have that uh, pre pre kinder go get your kindergarten screen well that's really too late mm -hmm. we really want to see kids at um, age three and those those screens again are done by the school district and they're for any child whether you have so you, no cost no cost and um, you make an appointment with your school district and it's really kind of fun because when you say screening for children it's really games you know that's how we do it and and so it's inviting for them and they get to play games and they get to you know uh, do little um, um, tasks with blocks and and I think that many children really enjoy the experience and really don't realize they were being screened and and the good thing is is that right now we have many more opportunities for children who um, may need a little extra help prior to getting into kindergarten and um, they're offered through the school district some are offered through you know various child care centers but we can help families access those experiences if we see their child early. If we, if we screen them when they're at age three and we can help them get into something in that year three, year four, prior to the time they go to school, sometimes that's all they need to be really much more successful uh, as they start school than if they hadn't been screened and we just started them uh, in school without you know much of a uh, precursor. Well, I, I assume that the earlier you intervene, the more successful the interventions are Absolutely. if a child is showing some early signs of developmental delay. Yep. And, and so how does the school district come in? They're, they have this thing called Early Childhood Family Education, ECFE. Yes. Yes. Is that part of this whole early childhood assessment and, and intervention? It certainly can be, and I think that um, it's interesting, you know, in the various school districts, early childhood family education it can vary, um, but it, we know that there are early childhood family education systems within some school districts that actually make home visits on very little babies and help the parents understand the community resources and, and work with, you know, early literacy. And then many of the um, early childhood family education programs are offered in various schools within the district, and there are variety of, of many interesting things, everything from massage and, you know, kind of baby mommy yoga and, you know, things that really kind of help 
moms understand the whole um, relationship and, and attachment to, you know, really very pre-kindergarten literacy stories and understanding, making projects. So it, it really varies. That's voluntary, whereas, you know, um, and, and all of that is voluntary, but um, with early childhood special education, there's a more therapeutic approach. Early childhood family education is really a fun approach and a, a fun way for families to learn together and for kids to get um, some pre-kindergarten skills. All right, so I have some vested interest. So in the last oh. 30, last 30 <laughs> seconds, what should grandparents do about early childhood development with their grandkids? Well, I think grand, any child who has grandparents is far ahead and in the first place. And I think that just doing the kinds of things that are fun, fun for you and fun for your child, and fun for your grandchild so that, you know, taking them fishing, taking them on a walk, doing some of the things that maybe parents don't always have the time to, to do, but kids learn a lot from those kinds of things. And, and it's in an environment that's, you know, um, really much richer and much more fun. Yeah, kids just want to have fun. And so they do. Grandparents <laughs> just want to have fun too. Karen, thank you very much. Thank this you. has been very helpful. Thanks for being with us. And I'll be back with a closing comment right after this message. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. Healthy babies are crucial to the long-term health and development of any society. That's why baby-friendly policy should get high priority. One of those policies is paid family leave. That is paid time off from work for the mother and or father of a new or adopted baby. Paid parental leave reduces the financial and psychological stresses on families, stresses that we know affect the health of a baby. Paid leave has been shown to have multiple other benefits. It helps improve the health of both the baby and the mother. In fact, paid leave reduces postpartum depression and lowers the risk of infant death. It also increases the initiation and continuation of breastfeeding and increases immunization rates and well-child visits. It even benefits employers in that it enhances morale, recruitment, and retention. Given this long list of benefits, it's perplexing that the United States is only one of three countries in the world that does not automatically provide paid family leave. Some people do get paid leave through their employers, but it's usually higher income employees and those who work for large employers. The people most likely not to get paid parental leave are people of color and American Indians and low income workers, the people who need paid leave the most. If we are to be a healthy society and have our children be successful, we need to have a discussion about mandating paid leave. It's a policy worth discussing because it has profound implications for the health of our community. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you can join us again next time on a Public Health Journal.